So my name is Rick McCauley. I'm a professor of graphic design at Broward College currently. Um, I've been there 15 years, and before that I had a second life, and that was as a photojournalist at the Miami Herald. Uh, when I started back in the 80s, it was during the Mariel boat lift, it was during the riots in, in uh, Overtown, it was also um, before that I did the, uh, the space shuttle taking off, photographed popes and presidents. Um, I even got to photograph Mel Fisher when he found the wreck of the Atosha, and I helped him find one of the first boxes of silver coins. Um, so from that exciting life, I've gone on to teaching, and, and what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about um, street photography itself. Why are we all here to, uh, doing all this stuff? Why is there an exhibit across the street that has over 63 different countries represented? And how many entrants were there? 6,000 something? 400? 4,000, I'm sorry, 4,000 entries in the competition. So I'm going to walk you back just a little bit. We're going to talk about the, the source of street photography and to talk about the ideology of street photography, which is different than, say, photojournalism or documentary photography or other types of photography that we're used to. Um, so Henry Cartier-Bresson was the person that coined the word the decisive moment. And the decisive moment is basically this. To take a photograph means to recognize simultaneously and within a fraction of a second both the fact itself and the rigorous organization of visually perceived forms that give it meaning. It's putting one's head, one's eye, and one's heart on the same axis. So the principle of that, I'll go back one more, um, is kind of exemplified in this photograph that he did use in his book about the decisive moment itself. And you take this look at this photograph, this is not a news photograph, this is not the Hindenburg exploding. This photograph doesn't change someone's life, no one died when this photograph was made. So it's not like photojournalism, there's no news event going on. In fact, most of street photography is about non-events, things that really are not going to change the world, except in their beauty of poetry. And that is basically what I'm going to talk about today. So the idea that we all go through the same life and we experience the world in different ways. What street photographers do is they actively go through life organizing within a frame what they think is interesting. They think with their brain, they feel with their heart, and they make photographs that make you maybe understand what it is to be human. They talk about the beauty and the humor and the irony and the absurdity of life itself. They are active viewers of life. They take notice of things no one else ever takes notice of. And I think that's what really makes it beautiful. So some examples here. Um, now, Henry Cartier-Bresson, just to give an idea of where we couch him, so he was friends with Monet, right? So Monet, Monet, that whole French movement. Um, and photography, of course, upset the apple cart for painters, right? So he was at that time in the 30s and 40s and 50s, um, on up to him passing away back in the 90s, I guess it was, of making photographs that weren't that important as news events. He did do photojournalism as well. In fact, there's interviews with him where he thought of himself as a surrealist, oddly enough. Um, but then someone told him, look, you can't make a living being a surrealist, but as a photojournalist, you got some possibilities going. So this idea of the decisive moment is something that's shared by many different styles of photography. In this case, let's take a look at the compositional elements that, um, and his first career was as, as a painter. So became, before he came and took up the camera, he was actually a painter, and a very good one, by the way, right? So he was competing with the likes of Monet and Manet um, for painting. He took that same intellectual curiosity about form and color and composition and, and made black and white photographs almost extensively. You look at the framing and the way the light is at just that one decisive moment, one second before or after the little girl would be outside of that square. Um, the rectangles in the receding foreground to background and the triangles and the lines that lead with the fences to the women in the far distance. The idea of the Mona Lisa, why is that important? Because in the foreground you have some woman looking at you with this enigmatic smile, and in the background over her shoulder is the first reference to the ideas of depth in a photograph or a painting. 
right? Uh, so it had a winding little road that went out through mountains in the background. That idea of creating a two-dimensional object that had three-dimensional space was something that painters started to unlock the idea of. And of course, photography upsets that apple cart pretty quickly because you can reproduce images that are um, direct and, um, and of course, today, all of us are doing it. But why are we seeing billions and billions of images, but we're stopped dead in our tracks by even these photographs that are more than 60 and 70 years old? Well, because there's this idea that the way the person thought about when they made the photograph was drawing your attention. It's pointing at something and saying, hey, look, while you're not looking at things in life. Um, for my students, I send them on an assignment. I have them go to the parking garage where they park every day, and I have them walk back and forth and just take pictures as they walk. And every time before they'd thought about this as being a drudgery, to go from the parking garage, sixth floor, to the classroom and back and forth was a horrible experience. And all of a sudden you got your camera around your neck and you're looking for things. It's a scavenger hunt, right? So um, this picture with the circle of the eye glasses matching the bullseye from the bull arena, right? Um, or the shape of the uh, broken out wall and the, the progression of kids going back in the distance. Just seemingly placed all in perfect relationship to each other to give you a sense of depth. Or this photograph of Monet in his own um, aviary that he kept birds. Right? This is not the photograph of Monet the painter, this is the guy who collected birds and loved to sit there and quietly play with his birds. Um, and then you have news photographs that he took. Now two things I'd like you to notice in, in a lot of these photographs. In this one, um, it is absolutely the quintessential decisive moment. So this is in, in after war France. You'll notice the striped pajamas of someone who was in detention camp. Um, and you see the passport on the table here. So this was basically all the people who sympathized with the Nazis were then brought to court, and they were tried in the public eye. Uh, some of these women were shaved of their head, stripped of their clothes, and sent out of town because they worked with the Nazis and sympathized with them. So this was a decisive moment that this photograph was made that shows you that Cartier-Bresson's idea of a decisive moment isn't just for street photography or noticing little compositional things, but it actually is a concretizing moment of history that we have to remember. It's bearing witness in this case. So this you would classify more as photojournalist, although it comes from the same aesthetic background. Or this quiet little scene in the rivers of France Um, or this photograph that's just kind of ironic. So this is your classic street photography, right? So when you look at it at first, you're thinking, oh, these people are watching a parade go by. That's kind of cool. And then you notice this guy down there with all the trash, and he looks drunk, and he looks like he's fallen. But it's metaphorically, it's a picture of society and how certain people don't fit in, so they drop out. What it's really a photograph of they were saving a space or they didn't want to touch elbows with each other. That's what's really going on. But the way it's photographed makes you think about what it looks like as different. And one of the terms I, I keep going back to is how you look at the world changes what the world looks like. Um, so we'll bring that up with a couple of different photographers. So here's the classic one. This was in the book, The Decisive Moment. And you notice that this is the moment where the heel is just off the water. A second later, his foot would be immersed. But also in the background, there's a, uh, a poster of a ballet dancer with the exact same pose going in the opposite direction. Waiting for that moment, so here he is, he's just out in a mud puddles, right? And he's looking around, he's thinking, what am I gonna photograph today? And he literally was a fly on the wall all through life. In fact, he was very rarely photographed at all. People, he didn't want people to know what he looked like. So for him, it was a big thing because he wanted to be able to capture these moments when no one was looking. That all of a sudden people say, wow, isn't that interesting? So some other photographers you might wanna take a look at, excuse me. Robert Doisneau, um, he was a photographer in Paris also, a little bit uh, in the 30s, 40s, 50s, um, until recent times actually, um, passed away a few years back. He has a sense of humor. He does photograph those moments again where just a few things are odd and going on in his photographs. It's juxtaposition. It's putting two objects in the same space together. In fact, creativity is that same act. It's taking two things that already existed in the world and putting them together in an interesting form, right? Um, so there is literally nothing new in the world, but guess what? 
You could take two old things and put them together and then you do have something new. So it takes creativity in a lot of ways. And what you decide to do when you see the world, uh, this famous shot, unfortunately I found out recently he hired these two models to pose for the photograph. Um, he had made some photographs previous to this um, in trying to get the mood set, and then he hired these two models, which became a big poster all over France, used in advertising campaigns and elsewhere. Or this subtle thing that you probably, many people have been through this park, no one noticed that over the centuries, maybe the sculptor had this sense of humor and said, what if this put this guy in stone staring at this woman's behind for the next century or so, right? And um, he just juxtaposed those items together in space. Or Pablo Picasso with uh, bread for fingers. I mean, how much fun is that? So a sense of humor is definitely an important thing with life in general. And think about, go back to thinking about the types of street photography you see. What are they really about? They're about life. They're about taking notice of life, about seeing things that we don't normally see and pointing your finger and saying, isn't life beautiful? Isn't it amazing? Um, Elliot Erwitt, another photographer, still alive, lives in New York City. He's been down here to UM a couple times to speak. I've had a chance to meet him. He is as funny as his photographs are. Um, if you want a great book to give as a Christmas gift, his dog's book, I think he did two or three of them. They're like yay thick. They cost like 25 bucks. You can get them at Barnes & Noble. Go back to the bookstore one more time, right? Um, and uh, his idea was, to me, photography is an art of observation. It's about finding something interesting in an ordinary place. I found that it has little to do with the things you see and everything to do with the way you see them. So he took photographs that were absurd. You're going to hear the word absurd used. And when you take a look at the photographs in the exhibit across the hallway, humor, absurdity, irony, these are all the language of street photography, right? Um, this photograph, which became extremely popular, probably his most money-making photograph of all time, is just a simple, you know, Parisian scene. And it was sold to everybody from Perrier to um, bread companies to all kinds of places. Or this uh, uh, photograph of the two Goya paintings next to each other um, that were hung in, uh, I forget the guy's name, but they were hung in uh, this guy's uh, bedroom and he could slide one out in the other. When the public was there, he had the fully clothed woman and when the public left, he had his private moments. Um, or this photograph of a nudist colony with a uh, drawing class, which is just classic, right? Um, so, what's interesting about each of these different photographers' styles, if you meet them, excitingly enough, uh, Elliot Erwitt is as funny as hell as his photographs are. Like this, you know, looking for the lost persons area. Are these people actually lost, or are they looking for someone that is lost? You're not quite sure. And this is one of the two books, or three books, uh, that he did just on dogs, and of course, um, subject matter of the people and their dogs. I think the idea that people look like their dogs probably came from some of his books or vice versa. I don't know if it's a chicken or an egg kind of deal going on. Or the Macy's Day Parade with Snoopy. Or the dog just perfectly placed so it takes the place of the person's head. Um, so the levitating dog. This is one of my favorite. Just, it just makes me feel happy. I don't know why. Um, so when you have an emotional reaction to photographs, that's a complicated thing to do, right? Think about um, the poems you've read or the books you've read and think about this photograph. And look at this photograph for a little bit. Anybody disturbed by this photograph? Anybody think something other than it's just two people carrying their monkeys out for a walk? Anybody know what the story behind this photograph is? Now you talk, you think about it, and you're thinking about race relations in America and the kind of prejudice that's faced with America. And it's a bunch of dark thoughts that makes me kind of angry when I look at it. This is actually two zookeepers that were taking the monkeys to a different location. And it was a cold day, so they put them in sweatshirts. That's what's really going on. But what Gary Winogrand did all the time is he challenged you as a viewer. He said, I photographed to see th what things look like photographed. So here's an innocent scene of some, pe some uh, zookeepers carrying a couple of chimpanzees, but it's a comment about a bunch of other stuff going on that we don't want to talk about. It forces us to look at these things. 
Um, some of his other photographs are just that crazy juxtaposition. The shape of the two rhinoceros are the same as the shape of the glasses that she's wearing. Or in this photograph, he looks like he melted into the cement. And everybody's looking up as if he just fell down. They're waiting for another one to fall down behind him. So the story is happening not in the photograph, but in your mind as you translate that information that you're seeing. And you don't believe it or you find it very interesting or odd. Um, or this photograph. How many wolves do you see in this photograph, right? That guy is as much a wolf as the wolf is behind him. So he did a whole series on women, um, which many people call misogynistic, maybe, um, perhaps. He did one on zoos also, a couple of books and different subjects. But he was interested in how things look when they were photographed, meaning that it's his, his interpretation that's being brought to the fore. So photographers really are... Um, about two things, light and perspective. In this case, how he looks at the world makes his photographs. You can tell his work from Elliot Erwitz in an instant. There's something else going on in the conversation. Just like you would not confuse um, uh, Beethoven and the Beatles. Uh, you wouldn't confuse these different photographers and their perspectives. One of the most important um, documentary photographers of all time, I think, and, and this has been called the best photography book of all time, is The Americans by Robert Frank. Um, and Robert Frank was a Swiss-born person. He came to the United States and got a Guggenheim Fellowship to travel the United States back in the 50s when America had just come out of the war and was had rising to the power of the number one power in the world. And he photographed it for what else was going on under the skin. He photographed it as a stranger that did not belong to America, that could see the things that we as Americans did not see. The race relations. If you take a look at this photograph, in the back of the bus literally are the black folks. In the front of the bus, dressed to the nines, is the white privileged child. And marking the distance between them is white bars in this trolley car through the streets of New Orleans. So this photograph becomes an indictment of America. And all the photographs in that book are a classic version of this. And in the foreword to that book, um, in the second printing, the first one was in French, in the second printing of it, Jack Kerouac got hired to write the story about it. He hung out with him at the time. He says, anybody don't like these pictures, man, don't like poetry, see? Anybody don't like poetry? Go home and see television with shots of big hatted cowboys being tolerated by kind horses. So if you're entertained by watching Kim Kardashian doing your thing, poetry probably ain't your thing, right? And Jack Kerouac knew that back in the 1950s when he wrote this. Uh, the photographs of race relations and this difficult uh, process that America was going through at the time. And the fact that instead of a fire, fireplace that you gathered around, it was the jute box. It was the introduction of all this new media that we're now immersed inside of. It was a time and a place and a location and the perfect photographer that all lined up to let you know what it was like to live at that time and that place. How politics was a giant base blowing smoke on the world. This is the place that led to Nixon being elected. Um, and we can look back at that with almost fond memories when we're looking at what we've got ahead of us, depending on your politics. Um, and he was photographing those things. He was photographing America not for what we saw it as, but for what a, a foreigner did. Very different photographer, very different style. Now we have Sebastian Salgado. I think quintessentially the best photographer of all time. Um, he does a doc, he's a documentary photographer is how I classically represent him. Um, he's a magnum photographer and has been traveling the world for years doing epic books. Um, if you have not gotten a chance to see his Genesis book or his Exodus book, um, yes, he does use Genesis and Exodus with the power they're intended to be. They're biblical books about the world and the planet we exist on. He started off as an economist, and he's got a PhD in economics. And while he was doing his study from Brazil, where he grew up, and following the progress of coffee around the world and what that meant to the world economy and how that worked, he wanted to document that process with a camera. So he borrowed a camera, started taking pictures, and as they say, the rest is history. If you've got a couple of more minutes and you want to go on um, a TED Talks, 
Uh, take a look at TED Talk where he talks about his family farm, which was hundreds and thousands of acres in Brazil, and how during his lifetime it had been stripped mined and basically reduced to ruin. And he returned there after he was almost dead, after doing his world large projects around the world um, and, and covering every corner of the planet. He came back to his home and inherited from his family this farm. And he re replanted over a million trees. And he brought back life to not only the earth that he was born to, but to a way of feeling and thinking about that earth in his photographs that he's made. Um, so we have photographs from the famine in Ethiopia. This is a few years back. Uh, pictures all through Mexico. Um, or in Brazil, this is the gold mines at Sierra Pelada. And so the gold mines basically is a square piece of earth that you own. You dig your way to hell, literally, um, on the backs of, um, of these people that have been hired to dig for gold. And you start to see just what powerful things going on on the planet and bearing witness. So in his way, he's bearing witness to what's going on that we don't want to see or we need to see that's vital for our understanding of what we're doing to our planet. The idea of exodus was exodus from war-torn areas or other problematic areas around the world, um, overpopulation, feast and famine. And then we have photojournalists like Josef Kadelka, um, who photographed his country, and this is in Prague during the um, invasion, um, or he did the book on gypsies. He's more akin to the street photography and very poetic, but he's documentary in that he photographed the gypsies and made book form projects on that subject, where he photographed every life event of this group of people. So in a way, it's anthropological and studying what peoples are like and what they do. So um, all of these, and I love this one, this, I, I, I think of it as the offspring. He's literally a spring off of the, you know, the father there. And you can see, you can hear the music in your head as you look at this photograph. Um, his beauty of composition and light and thinking about the forms and shapes is something that street photography share in common. And it all goes back to that decisive moment. So photographs that are more than just the surface of what the photograph is portraying, perhaps, and maybe the emotional state that you feel from looking at this photograph. So street photography lives in the intersection between photojournalism and documentary photography. It's the poetic brother of the family, if you will. Um, Alex Webb is here. Um, his exhibition with his wife, Rebecca Norris Webb, is right across in front of um, our exhibition there as well. Um, it's really great to see him, um, his work. He does do long form, and this is from his book, On Street Photography, um, which you definitely should pick up a copy if you hadn't had a chance to read it. It's published by Aperture. It says, I know how to approach a place by walking. For what does a street photography ph photographer do but walk and watch and wait? and wait, and talk, and then watch and wait some more, trying to remain confident that the unexpected, the unknown, or the secret heart of the unknown waits just around the corner. He's done books on Turkey and Cuba, the Violet Isles exhibition that he did with his wife. I think what's really interesting, if you take a look at the photographs, they're mounted on the wall, and you'll see RSW or you'll see AW, right? So Alex Webb, so you know which ones the, the male and the female of that photography partnership did. They went to the same place at the same time and photographed in generally the same areas, but they walked away with different perspectives. And actually, if you look carefully, you might see the more poetic, feminine version that Rebecca represents and the work of Alex, which is a lot more um, controlled, compositionally structured, um, with lots of details hidden with inside details. And the juxtaposition of forms and icons, and it's a visual language, and that's um, one that he does very well. So to me, street photography is like trying to catch a fish with your bare hands. Few people catch any fish whatsoever. Um, only a few, a handful, have the patience and skill to return every time to the light of those waiting on shore. So the chance of making that photograph is really worth all that time and all that money. Um, I think so, and I think that's basically what street photography is about. Okay, thank you very much.